Okay, I'm here this morning uh, with some morning thoughts, rapping about, I'm at war with the mystics. Um, that's a metaphorical phrase, but I'm in the space of the philosophical argument, figuring struggle with certain mystical ideas. Uh, these are like old, old dad's tales, you know what I'm saying? Old husband's tales. Um, I'm somebody who's interested in like the esoteric traditions, the hermetic tradition. Some people call it Western hermeticism. I don't think it's Western. I think it's older than Western. I think it's something that passes through the West and it passes through all kinds of different regions. I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it actually comes from Africa. Uh, Hermes, right? Thrice Great, also known as Thoth, also known as Tehuti. Um, but I don't want to get too far into that piece. The piece that I'm interested in this morning is uh, I've started to encounter the work of this gentleman. I don't know if he's a gentleman, Julius Evola. I think he was an Italian mid-century, mid-20th century uh, esoteric philosopher and really kind of fascist type of cat. And he really bent the hermeticism towards fascism and anti-modernism and anti-democracy. Uh, and it was also very racist. It's very white supremacist. And it's kind of this like mystical white supremacism of like the Aryan, right? And that whole kind of mysticism that was part of the Nazi movement. And really, I believe, um, in various ways was part of the whole European colonial project. And Evola was a real advocate of imperialism and he was an advocate of the Italians takeover of Ethiopia or their attempted takeover of Ethiopia because Ethiopia successfully resisted um, Italy's invasion. Now, the thing that I wanna say here in general is I think that if we're going to utilize these teachings for the 21st century and for not even a modern world, but a postmodern world, and I would say a, a world that's struggling towards not postmodernism, but I would say some kind of cosmopolitan synthesis and integralism. If we're really going to use those teachings and if they're going to be of value now, they have to meet our times. And here's one of my proposals. I am proposing that we are growing out of the Aryan theory. And I'm gonna go, oh, go ahead and since we're gonna use these mystical story threads that we are growing out of the Aryan race. And that was a big storyline in the esoteric literature and theosophy and anthroposophy uh, and a lot of these teachings in the middle of the last century and the middle of the 18th or 19th century. And here's why I think we're overcoming and over, uh, growing out of this stuff. And here's why I think a lot of the hermetic ideas, um, uh, particularly around these Aryan race theories, are, are really dangerous and haven't totally been grappled with in these hermetic teachings. Um, okay, the basis of white supremacy, in a way, and the basis of race science is blood purity. And the way that race science and blood purity uh, connects to to esotericism or the guy like this guy like Evola said is that there's this belief that there is there was there were these ancient races that had more power than we did or certain parts of these races have more power they have access to these spiritual dimensions that we don't have access to and that modernity is ruining all of that by leveling everybody out and taking out any idea of 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 uh, hierarchy and so you know basically going all the way back to Spain and like who is a multi-generational pure blood Christian to, you know, the whole aristocratic ideal that like there are rulers in the ruled and that it, that ruling and power wielding is hereditary and so is being a slave, right? Um, and then to our whole like 
one drop rule in the United States. If you have any bit of black in you, then you're black and you belong to a slave caste and that goes on for nine generations and so on. And so you have all these theories out there that are all about like the purity of blood and that that's the basis of white supremacy. And then it connects with mysticism through these Aryan race, mystical race, magical race. How do we get back to that type of thing? You know, that's it, it wraps itself with anti-Semitisms and all kinds of stuff. And I think one of the things that we're finding, okay, first of all, let's just say that there's something to that idea that uh, a capacity that a person has in their lifetime can be transmitted to their children um, and to their children's children or and that it may have been received from an ancestor. Okay, let's say that there's some intelligence to that and that over time human beings have observed that and we definitely observe it in plant and animal life okay again and that's also the basis of of eugenics theories which by the way i don't think we've defeated the eugenics idea and in this world of in the 21st century where we're actually manipulating genetics uh in a mechanical way and in an external way, this, these questions are going to be relevant again. And I think we're going to have to fight Nazism as a mysticism and as a scientism again. But but that's slight digression. But what we're finding is, you know, if there is a, a truth to uh, the idea that attitudes and capacities and even breakthroughs in consciousness that people experience in their lifetime can be transmitted generationally, like... Okay, let's say there's something to that. Well, what we're finding in the epigenetic study, first of all, is that that seems to be, there seems to be some truth to that. That if I have a life where um, I'm secure and where I feel physically and emotionally safe, um, then I exhibit like relaxation in my nervous system and even the neurotransmitters that are open and receptive are, are look different between people who've had a life where they've had a degree of safety and people who've had a life where they've been the victims of violence. And so what it looks like is that trauma trans, transmits intergenerationally and, and that so does resilience. And so what it suggests is that the blood is not something that can just be tainted and ruined and then it's never any good because then that gets you into the purity theories of don't touch these people, don't mix with these people and never do anything that could cause you like that could cause you to become unclean. Right. Um, and, and that's the basis of aristocracy separating themselves from the people that do the labor for them. Right. Um, and instead, what the epigenetics suggests is that is that the blood is malleable and that it can actually be impressed in either direction and that resilience again can be transmitted that breakthroughs in consciousness and i'm leaping a little bit off of what the science says that breakthroughs in consciousness can be transmitted that talents can be transmitted if somebody has a parent that say is a, a shaman you know oftentimes shamanism was hereditary although oftentimes it was something that people in their own lifetime it, people could identify oh that person has the leaning towards it so you know in 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 the hereditary idea of aristocracy and kings as well we had a royal line with that with, that was related to the gods and then that royal line has to continue unbroken and you find that in like lord of the rings and all that with the elvish blood and all that and so what epigenetics suggests is that essentially that the blood is redeemable, okay? And also that the blood can be injured. And, you know, I heard a story, I was on, I believe the Pine Ridge Reservation and there was an elder there who was talking about the Lakota having this belief that if you have a sacred woman and a sacred man, like somebody who's really devoted themselves to the spiritual world and to living a life of ethical conduct, um, and the sacred man and a sacred woman have a child, that that child will, will exhibit a lot of the qualities of their parents and have that like virtuousness in them. They'll be born with that. And then they believe that if that process continued for seven generations, a sacred man and a sacred woman, a sacred man and a sacred woman, a sacred man and a sacred woman, that by the seventh generation, the child would be a miracle worker. And I feel like this is also related to folklores about the seventh son of the seventh son, 
and all of these things. And so if there, if these ideas hold any water, which epigenetics suggests that possibly they do, you know, it's, it's, it's possible that people had these experiences in the past where they observed these things and they observed children born who had these certain capacities and they had already had parents that kind of showed threads of that. What it suggests is that is that not only is the blood impressionable and is it does it absorb and s store good impressions and transmit them, but that after a while there's like a cumulative breakthrough that can happen in the blood and that can happen genetically. So why is all this relevant? And why is all this relevant in the 21st century? And why is all this relevant in relationship to these discussions around uh, modernism and, versus, and cosmopolitanism versus like separation and racial superiority theories? I wanna try to t tie this to justice movements. Okay. In contrast to hierarchy theories and to elite theories, where only some people have access to power and resources and safety and respect, the general theory of the justice movements is that all people are entitled to that. And with a proper arrangement of, of society, that all people can have it. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna look like everybody there's going to be a king and a queen because a king and a queen is almost not, you can't almost understand them without having subjects. And we are in a democratic age, so people are not trying to be subjects to anyone anymore. Um, but what it means is everyone can be empowered. And through a proper arrangement of social and economic energy. And, and by deconstructing these mythologies that say that only some people, only a, an elite can have access, okay? And then when you take that stuff and you project that in the metaphysical and spiritual realms, you know, like the old way, the Aryan way, right? Because a lot of these Aryan theorists looked over at India and they said, oh, this is the fountain of, uh, of Aryan civilization. You know, it's either India or Greece and the Indian caste system was looked on as a model for how society should be organized and that, you know, guys like Evola said, since we've gotten away from these hierarchies that are the true ordering of, of, of life, that things have become more and more decadent. And so, you know, you look at India's caste system, it's a color-based caste system in a lot of ways. And that, you know, is was one of the, according to the people who were the the, purveyors of the idea of white supremacy that was sort of its origin and so what what we're what i'm trying to say here is that the justice theory is that everyone has deserves and can have access to society and that no one has to live or yeah resources and that no one has to live in a state of perpetual scarcity and degradation and I think a lot of times these ideas that are like, oh, a soul was born to this level and that level and is going to reincarnate infinitely on this level. That's just us projecting our social system out into the metaphysical world. OK, and and the justice theory is basically saying, no, like maybe all souls can attain enlightenment. Maybe all souls can attain breakthrough with the proper environment and the proper teachings, right? And so with a, a certain amount of safety in your life and a certain amount of access to material, emotional, and mental resources, everybody's soul can come online and become active, okay? And that if we can create a condition on the planet where that is the norm instead of the exception, and aristocratic theories say that's the exception and it should be, if we can create a condition on the planet where that's the norm. Now think about what would happen in that situation seven generations down the line when billions of people are living in a way where they have basic safety, where billions of people are living in a way where they have basic emotional uh, nourishment and healthy relationships and community, where millions or billions of people have access to the collective 
you know, bank of knowledge and education that has been built by all the different peoples of humanity. Um, you know, and when all those can come into alignment, then the person's soul powers are un unimpeded. OK, now soul powers can happen under a lot of conditions. But generally, what do you when you see monastic societies It's because they created an environment where there's a relative degree of stability and peace and quiet. And then the person can tune in there. Now, unfortunately, those monastic societies were usually based off of some kind of invisible hierarchy, invisible to them or ignored or justified under them. And we we're like, well, we're done with that. This is the age of democracy. That shit's dead. OK, and that's why I'm saying I think we are gotten to the point where we are past the Aryan race now. We are reaching past the hierarchical vision, the caste system vision, the pure blood vision. And instead, we're lo looking at a universal democratic alchemy okay and alchemy in the sense that we are trying to transform intergenerational trauma into intergenerational uh seventh sunness okay intergenerational like people have been living good and virtuous lives for seven generations and at the seventh generation miracle workers are born and miracle workers not born to the few but miracle workers in mass and the 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 elevation and the alchemization of the blood in mass around the planet. And that I think that that's actually the secret deeper spiritual mission of, of democracy, okay? That's the secret esoteric mission of democracy at this time is collective human liberation and liberation as a material situation, liberation as a political and cultural situation and liberation in the sense of like you get it from the Buddhist perspectives of a psycho spiritual liberation and that that does not have to be a basically constrained to an elite class, but that it can be universally accessible with a proper organization of the material and social world. And that is actually the basis of social justice theories, whether you want to look at anti-racism, whether you want to look at feminism, whether you want to look at Marxism, the basis of it, decolonization, you know, self-determination, the basis of it is organize the world in such a way to where violence is not systemic. OK, if if you're not down with those kind of things, look at Buckminster Fuller's world that works for everybody. OK, that's the real one of the main spiritual missions right now. We have to organize the world so that it works for everybody, okay? And now some people are worried. Well, if everybody has everything that they need, then you'll have a world of safety and non-striving. And that, I think, is a real concern. It's a real danger. And I think you see that in middle-class bourgeois societies that sometimes people get complacent. But I think as human beings, we are purposeful creatures. We want to direct our energy towards something day after day. And when we are not in a state where there's systemic violence and people are on the run for their lives and scrambling for survival, meanwhile, the class that's oppressing them is always trying to strategize about how to keep the people down because the natural state of all human beings is to actually stand up. You know, the natural state of all human beings is to be dignified. The natural state of all human beings is to be respectful and curious about other people. And oppression has had to create, has to had to waste human energy by trying to stomp other people down physically, organizationally, tactically, resource wise, ecologically, and also create a bunch of spiritual justifications for it. And these traditionalism ideas, these anti modern ideas of like the old is where the spirit, where we have the most spiritual truth now i think there is something valuable about that there's some there's some intelligence in that but fundamentally i think once you had a hierarchical society and people were out of indigenous societies and you had to oppress another people to maintain your position in the hierarchy i think those people started to lose access to their spiritual powers as well and that's why you find a decline universally in monarchies because over time, the doer of violence, what we see in the trauma theory is that the doer of violence is also a traumatized person. And that trauma shuts off access to the higher levels of the DNA. It shuts off higher access to the, uh, to the higher levels of neurotransmitters. It makes you unable to concentrate in the same way. It makes you unable to relax. It makes you sicker. 
And that's definitely, we see that in people who have been intergenerationally oppressed, but we, but also I think what's understudied and what we're gonna find is that the oppressors have that same issue as well, or they have a, a different version of that issue, you know? So we're past the Aryan theory, you know, that we're past the fifth race. If you wanna use the old theosophy, we are entering into the sixth race and the sixth race is the cosmic race. The sixth race is the cosmopolitan race. The sixth race is human beings in spontaneous relationship with one another. You know, um, the Mexican esotericist and political philosopher, Jose Vasconcelos basically put forth and a lot of his ideas were still messed up too and you know white supremacist in a way but he basically put forth because he was talking about mexico as a mestizo nation he was basically saying eugenics through through love eugenics through taste if two people genuinely love each other not because they're supposed to because this cast says you were supposed to marry this person to breed that person people genuinely love each other that love gets transmitted into the cells of the children and the children are born more beautiful they're born more intelligent they're born more loving and that's what the eugenics that he was suggesting that was a natural selection that he was suggesting natural selection through love so you know these are not complete thoughts these are thoughts in progress but what I really am trying to reiterate here and get at again is that there is a lot of strains in the esoteric and hermetic literature that are anti-modern and that are hierarchical and that are anti-democratic and many of them anti-feminist, anti-woman. And we don't need that anymore. And that's not the way to go anymore. That's not what time it is anymore. And that... We need to bring those teachings into relationship with the actual movements that are happening in our times. And we need to bring the movements into the relationship with those teachings. Because another thing is that the movements, I feel like, are a little bit unfocused in terms of their long goal. You know, we're trying to create a society where billions of human beings can express the totality of their powers. And then instead of having a select race of superhumans, we'll have a race, we'll have a planet, we have a species of superhumanity. And that's actually only the beginning because once billions of people are functioning as soul-infused human beings, then we have this bigger job of transforming the actual material nature of the planet itself. All right, I think the helicopters are giving me the signal to cut this one off. Old dad's tales, old husband's tales. Instead of talking to myself, instead of invisibly or madly just yapping about the mystics and being at war with the mystics, I'm recording it and I'm putting it out here as collective resources that maybe someone will find value in at some point in the future. Peace.